welcome back to the live painting demonstration. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about how to oil out a painting. We're going to continue working on the one that we did of the brick and the orange from last week. So tonight we're going to be working on shape, uh, color, and value still. I'm also going to talk a little bit later about different types of brushes real quick. We could do a whole show just on brushes, but I will uh, definitely talk about some different types of brushes tonight. There's quite a bit out there. Uh, so this painting's been sitting for about a week. It's totally dry now. So what we want to do is we want to go in and want to do a process which is known as oiling out. So I take this refined linseed oil. This is an artist grade linseed oil uh, from a company, uh, Daniel Smith makes this. I would not recommend using a hardware store linseed oil. It has to be artist grade. You just take a clean rag and we're just going to wipe it into this painting. And what this will do is it will allow the pigment to now be more workable again when we go to work with the new paint going on top of the surface. And it's going to lift a little bit of pigment. That's okay um, because we're going to work on top of that anyway. It's not a finished painting yet. This will allow when you go to paint on top of it for the colors to mix in uh, more smoothly and also makes the canvas surface not as rough and textured. So you get more, I guess I would call it fluidity in the stroke and how you paint. Don't have to put too much on. It, it will, uh, if you put too much on, it will run. That's okay. But you just take a rag and you just rub it onto the surface. You just kind of want an even layer across things. And that's really all we'll need. Um, that'll prep it and get it ready to continue painting. All right, set that aside. All right, so now I'm looking at it. We're gonna go back into this uh, painting again. Uh, always wanna work dark to light like we talked about last time. So I'm gonna to have to mix up some color. So the darkest value, I'm gonna uh, ignore the black at this time. The darkest color that I wanna start with is in this block. And we've moved this a little bit since last time because we've done some other um, still lights and things in the, sh in the light box. So. Um, it may be slightly different than last week, but that's okay. We can work with that. So I'm making a brownish color for that shadow. And really brown is a combination of uh, basically all of the primary colors uh, combined together. So your uh, pyrrole red, your ultramarine blue, and your cadmium yellow will make this kind of brownish color. You can kind of see that there. So when I mix this up, I'm gonna hold it up. I got one eye closed, my right eye is closed, my left eye is kind of looking at the tip of the brush to the object to see if it's close. And I'll see how that translates on the canvas. So last week it was a little bit uh, more purple, but that's okay because it's, uh, you don't worry about the color uh, until the end. We do shape, color, and then the value. The value is gonna be how brown is this brown to like the side brown or the top reddish brown. In that relationship there. Again with the strokes when you paint you can kind of do that abstract brushing to it. I don't want to sit there like we talked about last week and just do uh, stripes like this. I kind of jump around and that creates more of a natural look and natural finish to it. So I'm going to go back in uh, as I work with this I want to make slight adjustments when I'm looking at the object I can see in my eye, I don't know if it's translating on the camera well, but about two inches in is very dark compared to the rest of this, almost like there's an indent in the block. So to darken that, I might try a little bit of, uh, very little bit of blue, ultramarine blue in there, just to try that and see how that works. Maybe I'll grab a little bit of ivory black. That's a lot of black, that's okay. I'll put that off the side so you can just leave it because you might dip into that later. And we'll just kind of go in here and we can darken that up a little bit. I think it's got a little bit more red in it. So you can adjust the color. You can make the color on the palette entirely if you want and spend your time color checking there before you put it on the canvas. That's one approach. I've been mixing paints and colors so long that I tend to try to mix it on the canvas while I'm doing it and make those adjustments because I know what direction the color needs to go just from years of uh, doing it and painting and things. So 
Now I'm going to pull back that little bit of shade there. And it's always amazing when you work with a light box how dark everything is in reality versus when we look at it in a photograph. If you're watching this on the video or you know took a photograph of this still life to paint from, you're going to find that it's much more bright uh, in the photograph than in real life. The cameras will tend to do that. Um, they're very, very good nowadays with making things much more light than they really, really are. If you start painting from life more, you'll notice how dark uh, most objects really are and how dark most colors are. We talked uh, last week about uh, dirty color too. Dirty color is kind of that organic color. It's very rare to find a 100% pure natural color. It's always gonna be uh, something that's got, it got, almost looks like it, was, like it was out in the dirt. I mean, it's, they call it dirty color because it looks like it was out in the dirt. There's a little bit of highlight on this uh, end of the brick. So I'm just throwing that in. Now when you, you jump around and bounce around with this, um, you don't have to worry about getting every little nook and cranny and detail of the brick in there. The illusion will happen when you're standing back seven feet away from it. If you get your colors right and you get your values right, it'll look real when you step back from it. When you're up close, you're gonna see obviously all the little detail, but the real trick, most people are gonna see your painting from about six or seven feet away. So it's not gonna really matter what every little detail and nuance is. Uh, you don't sit there and waste your time doing all that. So just kind of get it up there and um, represent it. And the, the eye and your mind will make the detail once you step back from the painting. And I think that's kind of the fun of the painting. Um, and one of the things that I enjoy is that my interpretation in my mind of the painting is going to look totally different than how your mind and interpretation of the painting is going to be. So if I were to sit there and put every single little detail into the painting, well, sometimes I'd be robbing you the enjoyment of your mind interpreting all those details on its own. So I respect, you know, photorealism and those types of paintings. I think that those people that pull that off of a you know, tremendous talent, but, um, you know, at the same time, I like to see a little bit of the artist's hand in the work and also um, allow my audience's mind and their eye to try to interpret it how they see it. And, and that's kind of a fun thing because not, you know, everybody's going to look at the painting and see something different. That's just how our minds work. I'm just working on the highlights here. I'm starting to think about how the relationship of these values work together between this brown, and I'm working out of the same pool of color on the palette. So I'm looking at the relationship of how this brown and that brown and the other brown all relate to each other. So the, the one on the top, what degree of brightness is it compared to the side? That's what I'm looking at and working with. So now I'll go in and we'll work on that side as kind of a middle between these two, between that value and the darker value. Again, I think we've kind of moved it a little bit, so I see a little bit more side tonight than last week, but that's okay. There's just a little bit of red in there. Got to be very careful when you add the paint. It's very strong, different colors. You can always add more. You can always take it away too. That's another thing, a uh, good thing to point out is you can take your rag and go in here. If I were to make a mistake, take your rag and just wipe out that color. That's one of the nice things with the oil paint is it's so forgiving uh, versus like if you're just doing this in pen and ink you know, if you drew a line, you're gonna to have to get white out or, or do something, um, you know, more like taping it off or so to hide that line. But the oil paint's very, very forgiving in that regard. So I'm gonna clean up this brush. I wanna go back in and define some of this black that we had for the shadow. So I'm just cleaning that out. Clean it out with just thinner. I'm just going straight into ivory black. 
Now you could go in there and make a different black if you wanted to. Um, I could use that same brown and pull some blue into there to do that, but for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to go in straight black. So because I put that oil out on here earlier, it makes this surface very easy to drag this brush across. If I didn't have that on, it'd be kind of like you'd feel it like this type of motion uh, when you go to pull that line. But because the surface is oil, that makes it a lot easier to work with. Not too worried about the background yet. We'll get into that maybe hopefully in a little bit before we finish up. Just pulling in here. A very small shadow on this. And when I'm looking at it in that shadow, it actually looks more of a purple, a dark purple. So I think I will go in and make that. And what they call that in the painting world is what's known as non local color. And what that is, is you know, for years back around the 17th century, 16th century, all those older paintings, shadows were always either done in brown or black, but it took the impressionist to actually say, hey, you know what, there's color in those shadows too. Don't forget to look at that. And that became kind of a revolution in that painting was that there was actually what they called non-local color because the object being orange in this case is gonna influence that shadow and because the, the opposite of the orange is purple in the color wheel, it's going to come out as a purple hue in that shadow. The redness of the brick also helps a little bit with that. If that were on a white surface, that would be a little bit more difficult to see. So again, I'm just adjusting my values as they come around. It's a little bit lighter on this side. We got a light source over on this side too. Go back in. I want to make a little bit more purple. So it's constantly just mixing the paint, moving the paint, seeing what works, where you need to go, how you need to adjust it, and then eventually you get somewhere where you think it looks okay. All right, I want to go back in uh, with my highlight. My brush isn't cleaned out of the way. It's okay. And I just want to kind of define that shadow a little bit. So the painting is just a series of perpetual corrections until you get it pretty much where you want it. All right, I'm not going to spend too much time on the shadow there. That's okay. Gives you the idea. All right. So now I'm going to work on the orange. So I'm going to mix up some orange here. Pyrrole red, cat yellow. For the shadow of the orange, I'm going to throw in a little bit of blue too. in here it's kind of like this reddish brownish color in the shadow of the orange again I'm not too worried about every little detail on the orange I'll show you something here once we get closer to having that finished what I'll do now is I got kind of my base color in for the orange shadow and now I can work towards the light so if I want to work towards the light I'm going to add some cad yellow to that just to continue to build up that color out of there. Took it a little bit too yellow, so I'll grab a little bit of red. just letting the brush kind of dance around on the canvas. I don't want to sit there and blend 
all of these colors together because if I do that, it will help, it will hurt the illusion of it being more uh, natural. Look more like a polished ball or sphere sitting up there. Working towards the light here. It's a little bit more yellow than my reference, so I'll go in a little bit more red because red and yellow, like we all know, make the orange. So, but if I sit here and I dab this, kind of dance around with it, it's going to begin to create that illusion of the peaks and valleys in the skin of the orange. kind of punching it in on the canvas. I'm not dragging the brush up or down. Okay, now I might move into like a smaller brush. I'm going to uh, wet it with my medium. It's just thinner and stand oil. This is just more of a detail brush. It's a clean brush. I'm just going to pick straight up into that cadmium yellow. I already got enough red and orange on there. Uh, but just kind of go in and we can start looking at some of the other highlights on this here. Because the red, the red and the orange is already on there, I don't need to add it to that paint. And this is just a constant adjustment of looking at your source. I might put a little bit of red in there again just to get a little texture. And you could sit here and you could do hours, multiple sessions on this. And if you wanted to, you could sit there and draw every little um, dimple on the orange. You could certainly do that if you wanted to. Uh, but for the purpose of this video, we're not going to get that detailed. I just want to kind of show you the approach. Now the white, you can go in and you can begin to kind of punch in. This is when it really starts to come alive when they... You know, you start to get some of these little highlights and things. What really makes it kind of fun. It's kind of in nature too. You're never really going to find anything that's like true, true white. It's very rare to find. If you're looking at real color, it's really rare to find something that's pure, pure white like that. Even like a highlight on a piece of glass is going to catch you know, some of the, the sky or the room that it's in. It's very, very rare. Um, you might find a slight drop of light that's pure white, but it's very rare to see that. mentioned before in the other video you got to be careful with um, using white too because it can chalk up your painting and kind of make it look ghostly it's a very strong color or lack of color I guess whatever you want to call it but to be very careful with it and I think the fun part will be when we add the little stem here don't need much color there, it's just kind of a little green. Let's see, it's just thinking if I want to darken that up or not, probably. Kind of want it to be more of a dirtyish kind of green that back shadow, then I can always drop the highlight in on top of it. I'm just seeing where it falls here. That's it, and then we'll put a little highlight on the other side. 
clean that out. It doesn't have to be too perfect. You want to grab a little white. You can work off that same green. So again, you don't want it to be true white, which it's probably not. If anything, I think it's going to drop a yellow in there. And you just kind of go in and drop it in there as well. So now I can go ahead and put in the background around the orange. I can start to reshape this too. If you're worried about having something, you know, where the, the orange shape wasn't right and you want to fix that line, you can go back in with your background color and outline it too at the end. Don't have to, but you can if you want to. Shape that orange how you want it to look. move from last week so I want it to be a little bit more over here. I kind of ran that black down a little bit too far. So we just take our rag, easily remedied, wipe it right out of there. The background's kind of light from last week. We just kind of threw it in quickly, but you could sit there. I usually do probably two or three different coats on the background. This is just an ivory black background. It'll dry with that matte finish like we saw before when we started oiling it out. When you wet it, when you go in at the end of this painting and if you were to varnish it, it brings all of that shine back up to everything. You don't have to worry about it drying matte. Some people get concerned that's gonna look like that and it won't once you varnish it out. You could use a bigger brush for the background if you wanted to, it'd be a little bit quicker. I just tend not to. I don't know why, it's just my thing. I like the smaller brush. Um, I think it gives more of that random abstract brush stroke to it. If you were to get close and look at the brushwork, it's uh, kind of all over the place. And I, I think that looks more natural in my opinion, but you see some people go with a big um, flat brush and kind of go over the whole background. Working towards the white in the foreground, easily done. Just add some white. I need a little bit more medium in there. I can feel the brush is dragging as I go into my medium. I want it to be more fluid. I'm just mixing the paint on the canvas quickly here. Again, if you jump around here like this and you don't, you know, sitting there trying to do every single little stroke, it'll look a lot more uh, natural than if you sat here and went, you know, line, 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 back and forth, back and forth. It's not going to look right. And you can really sit here and you can get every little nuance of every little gradation, change of color and value, you know, inside the light box, the wood that it's on. You could really push this as far as you want it to go. But, you know, for the purposes of this video, this is just a demo to show you kind of the thought process of going through the painting. If you could just need a little bit more highlight on the top, I just think it would look nice with the contrast there. Check that. Maybe shaping the block a little bit. 
back to this side too, so they kind of stay tied together. That's pretty much it. I mean, that's an hour's worth of painting. You could sit there, like I said, and, and go through it and adjust everything and continue to move it around. But for an hour's worth of painting, I think we're pretty satisfied with that. So that being said, real quickly, I just wanted to talk about different types of brushes. Um, I brought out a few tonight and we can go over more later, um, but we can kind of take these uh, together here. Um, so this brush here, uh, it's made with hog hair. That's a very common material for painting. Uh, a lot of artists will use that. This is known as a round brush or a bright brush. You might hear it called uh, two different names. This particular brush is a size 12. What's now, what's really interesting with brushes and something to know is that this brush by Signet, Robert Simmons, number 12, may not be the same size as a number 12 by another manufacturer. They can vary in size. So it doesn't necessarily mean if you order a 12 here and you order a 12 and another brand of brush, that's gonna be the same size. It can definitely be different. So this uh, next brush, again made by Signet, uh, Robert Simmons brush, is a flat brush. Uh, and that would, again, you know, different types of strokes um, on the painting. Um, this, again, uh, this is a 14, so it's a little bit more large. Um, this would be more like if you wanted to pull line vertical, or if I'm doing a background, I might use that. Uh, whereas the bright brush, I would do more of like punching in textured values, skies, clouds, uh, waves, uh, those types of uh, things as well. Now this is the same uh, bright brush, it's just smaller. Um, another thing to know about oil painting brushes is that they're longer than a watercolor brush. You might see a brush that's this big, that's generally a watercolor brush. And the idea with the oil paint brush is that when you're back further, like we kind of talked about earlier in the video, the further back you get, the more illusion of that painting that you'll see whereas the watercolor brush is gonna be uh, shorter. Uh, this is just another uh, flat. This feels more like a synthetic uh, fiber on this particular brush, it probably is. Um, I got a whole bunch of brushes that I really don't know uh, where they came from, but over the years I've just collected. Uh, so you can just feel uh, the softness and difference uh, of the different types of brush. Um, this last one that I'll show you, and we can talk more about brushes, um, uh, it can go really in depth. Um, this one is what they call a cat's tongue, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as like a filibert brush too, but this is kind of stiff, like I'm kind of putting some pressure on it. They have it treated uh, with the material from, this is a brush made by the company uh, Escoda, and they're out of uh, Barcelona, Spain. What's nice about the cat's tongue brush is I can get super detailed with this point at the top of it. And I can do a lot of really decorative fine line work if I wanted to. Or once I go and apply pressure, I can get a line that's anywhere from this diameter to the diameter here at the bottom just by applying pressure. Or I can turn the brush at a 90 degree and I can pull another line that is now the width of this ferrule on this brush. So that's a really nice thing. I'm a big fan of the cat's tongue uh, brushes and I got different sizes there. If I had to pick you know, one different br one brush that I would, uh, work with most routinely uh, out of these five, it would probably be a cat's tongue brush. Um, with the paintings that I've been doing, um, I've been using, again, these brushes are made by um, Escoda uh, in Barcelona, they're handmade. When you get into detail work, you want the brush to be a soft hair fiber on the end of the brush. So in this case, I'm using a sable brush and what that'll do is it'll allow for more blending and more smooth detail and also allows for the paint to get loaded into the brush more effectively. So when you go to apply it to the canvas, you don't have to keep dipping into the paint. It'll stay in there quite a bit all the way down through uh, the hair fibers on that. You're going to see, again, more texture on your hog hair brush, but you're going to see more detail, less texture on your sable brush. So the softer the brush, the less texture that you'll see. And that's the idea with the sable brush. So I hope you've enjoyed this video tonight. Uh, what I may end up doing is putting this painting in my store on my website if anybody wants it. Uh, it'll be pretty reasonably priced just for fun. Uh, we'll be back next week. If you have any questions, please be sure to comment. I will absolutely answer them for you. And um, 
you know, happy painting, and I hope you guys stay safe out there and have yourself a great week, and we'll connect later. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for notifications of future videos. If you have a question about art or this video, please be sure to leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Happy painting and God bless.